So hello there and welcome to this revision video focusing on the topic of Germany and the growth of democracy. Today we're going to be looking at Weimar democracy and the Weimar Republic between 1919 and 1929. So you're going to be looking at political change and unrest, including the Spartacus Rising, the Cat Putsch and the Munich Beer Hall Putsch. We're also then going to look at the golden age of the Weimar Republic during the so-called Stressman era. And we can see the man himself, Gustav Stressman, uh, picture of him there. We're going to look at the economic uh, changes that happened during this time, including the new currency, the impact of the Dawes and the Young Plan, and the US loans, and the impact of internal agreement on recovery. And we're going to look at Weimar culture. So without further ado, let's go. So just before the end of the First World War, Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated and a democratic government would be set up in Germany. And the first president of this new Weimar Republic, as it would become called, um, was this man, Friedrich Ebert. He was the leader of the Social Democratic Party and he was the first president of the Weimar Republic right up until his untimely death, actually, um, from appendicitis in February 1925. So. In 1919, the, this new Weimar Republic um, created a constitution. Now, a constitution is essentially a set of rules which lays out how a country should be run. And it's important that you know um, the, the Weimar constitution because it will enable you to understand the framework in which the Weimar Republic operated. So right at the top of the Weimar Republic was the um, president. Now, the president was elected every seven years by the people, and it was the job of the president to appoint the chancellor. Now, one of the key things for you to be aware of is that within the Weimar constitution, after Article number 48 said that in an emergency, the president could make laws without asking the Reichstag. And this becomes very important in Germany in the 1930s when a chancellor called Heinrich Brüning is able to run the country through Article 48 and President Hindenburg. Now, it's interesting to note that there are only two presidents, the Weimar Republic, um, Friedrich Ebert and then Paul von Hindenburg, who was the president until his death you know, on the 2nd of August 1934. And then obviously Hitler took over and became the Führer. Now, the president appointed the chancellor. Now, the chancellor is a little bit like a prime minister. Chancellor means leader. Um, they're a member of the Reichstag. They're appointed by the president. And the um, chancellor had to have the support from the majority of the Reichstag, which was the German parliament. Now, the chancellor was the leader of the Reichstag, the German parliament, and the German parliament was elected by a system called proportional representation, which meant the parties got the same proportion of seats as their proportion of vote, which is very, very, very democratic, very, very fair, but also creates a political system where there are many political parties, which mean parties have to work together in what are called coalitions. Um, the Weimar Republic was one, one of the most democratic um, systems of government in the world at that time, the German people. Um, got a lot of rights and um, free speech, freedom of religion, which is really, really great. But it also made it hard to rule and control Germany. So all adults, men and women, vote for members of the Reichstag every four years. And they voted to elect a president every seven years. Now, if you study Weimar elections, you'll note that elections um, tended to take place more often than every four years. Um, but um, they had to take place every four years. They also elected members for their regional parliaments, which were known as the Reichsrat. So that's really important to understand the framework of Weimar, the Weimar Republic and understand the Weimar Constitution. Now, then, the other thing that's important to understand is what we call the political spectrum. Um, so what we mean by left wing, what we mean by right wing, and then the parties in the middle that we sometimes call moderate political parties. So on the extreme left wing, we have the Communist Party, um, sometimes um, referred to as the KPD later on um, in, in the course. Um, and they're obviously inspired by the Russian Revolution. And we see things like Spartacus Rising, for example, in January 1919, which is inspired by the Communists. Now, the main parties that are associated with the Weimar Republic in terms of supporting the Weimar Republic are the Social Democrats. So Friedrich Ebert was from the Social Democrats and wanted to help the workers, sort of socialist in their nature. Um, the Centre Party, which sought to protect the Catholic Church, um, known in Germany as the Zentrum. There's the Democratic Party, which was a middle class party. The People's Party, supported by middle class and industrialists. And these are the main political parties that form the background of support for the Weimar Republic. 
And then in terms of the political spectrum, we have the extreme right wing party. So we have the, the Nazi party, the German National Party, and they wanted Germany to be strong and powerful again. And the German National Party, the DNVP, as it's known, particularly favoured a return of the Kaiser. Um, the army generals and the Freikorps are also part of the sort of more right wing political views. Uh, they didn't like the Weimar Republic and they wanted Germany to be militarily strong. Now, it's particularly amongst the extreme right wing um, parties and, and ideas where we get this idea um, of the stab in the back myth and the idea of November criminals. So during the early years of the Weimar Republic, there was a huge amount of political opposition. And it's important for you to know some examples of that. So in terms of the left wing, there's the Spartacus rising that takes place in January 1919. Now remember, this is only you know, a couple of months after the end of the First World War. Um, the Spartacus are led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. And the workers, you know, they're protesting throughout Germany at the start of 1919. And the Spartacus, they tried to turn this into an opportunity to have a revolution. And now President Ebert was able to use um, a group of um, what were known as the Freikorps, who were basically ex-German uh, soldiers, uh, used these Freikorps to crush the uprising with over 100 workers um, killed and Luxembourg and Liebknecht themselves were both killed. Now, the Freikorps were no supporters of the Weimar Republic, but they obviously preferred the Weimar Republic to be in place rather than the communist revolutions. The Freikorps fairly right wing, um, and that segues nicely into the Cat Putsch of 1920, because the Cat Putsch of 1920, of March 1920, involved Wolfgang Kapp, who was a nationalist. He wanted to bring back the monarchy in Germany. And basically, this was a right wing uprising led by Cap, and it was sparked basically by the Weimar Republic reducing the size of the army and getting rid of the Freikorps. So this um, this protest actually involves the Freikorps themselves, the very people that um, crushed the Spartacus rising. They marched to Berlin and the army refused to stop them. General Siegt, um, the uh, the commander of the army, um, very famously said, troops do not fire on troops. Um, now, normally when governments lose support of the army, in this case, they fall and um, the government fled to Stuttgart and the rising however was eventually put down by a general strike organized by the workers and the Weimar Republic survived. So we see this sort of nice um, sort of balance in terms of the left-wing Spartacus rising being um, stopped by the right-wing Freikorps and then the right-wing Cat Putsch being stopped by the left-wing workers um, and so the Weimar Republic survived. But you know the Weimar Republic in Germany um, between 1919 and 1922 hugely unstable there were 376 political murders during this time, including people like Matthias Erzberger, who was a politician who signed the armistice. Uh, Weimar Foreign Minister Walter Rathenau was killed in June 1922. So huge amounts of political assassinations. And most of those political assassinations were carried out by the right wing forces. The vast, vast majority of them were. OK, so another famous uprising that takes place is um, the Munich Beer Hall Putsch. And this, of course, involves the Nazi Party. Now, Hitler had joined the Nazi Party in the early 1920s and taken it over and very much had transformed and created a lot of the institutions and organizations within the Nazi Party that we would become familiar with. So Hitler um, saw his opportunity to take power in November 1923, um, which, of course, was at the peak of the hyperinflation crisis. So Hitler, along with General Ludendorff, who was a popular World War I leader, so again, we can see here disaffected military, right wing, um, they tried to seize power by force. Now, the Nazi party, when it um, began, was initially very popular in southern Germany within Bavaria, uh, based around Munich, which um, is, the, is the, the big city in Bavaria. Um, and by 1923, the Nazis had 50,000 members and their own private army, which, of course, we know as the SA. Um, now, Hitler thought that he would be able to um, use his sort of newfound support as an opportunity to take power by force. Uh, he felt he could win the support of the right wing prime minister of Bavaria, who was called Gustav von Kahr, and the leader of the Bavarian section of the German army, who was called General Otto von Losso. So on the 8th of November 1923, Hitler interrupted a right wing meeting of around about 2000 people at the Munich Beer Hall, um, hence the name the Beer Hall Putsch. 
again, Putsch means uprising, involved 600 SA soldiers, um, he, he basically jumped on a table, um, fired shots into the air and said the National Revolution has begun. Um, he forced um, Gustav von Kahr and Otto von Losso into a side room, forced them at gunpoint to say they would support a march on Berlin to overthrow the government. Um, the Weimar Republic, the government gets word of this though, President Ebert finds out, he declares a state of emergency and he orders Otto von Losso um, to crush the revolt. And so what happens on the next day is the, is the Beer Hall Putsch fails. Von Karen von Losso announced that they weren't going to support the Putsch. It's funny how not having a gun pointed at your head changes your mind about these things. And they did. 2,000 armed Nazis marched in, in uh, Munich, but they were stopped by armed police and the Bavarian soldiers. Um, and it dissipated. It ended fairly quickly. Shots were fired. 14 Nazis were killed. Ludendorff was arrested. Hitler was arrested, later having fled the scene. Later on, he would claim that he'd been taken an injured boy to hospital, but in reality, we know he ran away. Um, Hitler was arrested, the Nazi party were banned, Hitler went on trial, and he actually used his trial to get across his political message, claimed he was justified in his actions, talked about stabbing and back myth, November criminals, and he was in prison for five years. Now, the judiciary in the Weimar Republic was fairly right-wing and, and undoubtedly had some sympathy for Hitler. He only serves nine, nine months of that five year sentence. So it's very lenient for somebody that has been found guilty of treason. Whilst in prison in the Landsberg Fortress, he very famously is a picture of him in prison there. Um, he very famously writes his book, Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. And here he goes through some of his um, key political ideas. One strong leader, the Aryans of the master race. All Germans should be united in one country. Communism must be destroyed and the army must be rebuilt and used to invade land in Eastern Europe known as living space or Lebensraum. So it's very important um, to understand that some of the foundations of the Nazi party were established here. And actually, um, although the Munich Beer Hall Butch is a failure at the time, it was able to use it as an opportunity to create some successes. So after the failure of the Munich Beer Hall Putsch, we have an era in German history which is known as the Golden Age of the Weimar Republic, or the Golden Twenties. Now this man here is Gustav Stressemann, and he's the politician who dominated this era. He was the Chancellor of Germany for 100 days, being appointed in August 1923 until November 1923, and he was then Foreign Minister. Uh, and he um, was really important in solving some of Germany's problems in 1923. His policy can be summed up by the word fulfillment in that he was promising to work with other countries and fulfill the terms of the Treaty of Versailles. And by doing so, he hoped to show how unfair and how unworkable the Treaty of Versailles was in the hope of getting some more concessions from other international countries, which, of course, he was able to do um, later on with the Dawes Plan and the Young Plan. So the first thing that Stressman did was introduce a new currency, which was known as the Rentenmark. Now, one Rentenmark replaced 1,000 billion marks. Now, this very quick recovery led to this new currency and the introduction being referred to as the, quote, miracle of the Rentenmark. It brought inflation under control. German people received some compensation for their losses, um, but the German people wouldn't forget um, the impact of the hyperinflation crisis. And that would come back to haunt the Weimar Republic and it would develop a reputation for not really being particularly effective at managing the economy. The second policy was that he ended the French occupation of the Ruhr. Um, this was key because the um, passive resistance in terms of paying the workers in the Ruhr, but they weren't working. Um, was the root of some of Germany's economic problems. Um, he promised to pay the reparations and follow the Treaty of Versailles. But of course, this policy was very unpopular among right wing nationalists at the time. So some of the key features of the Weimar Republic um, during the Stressman era or the Golden Age was um, an improvement of Germany's relationship with other countries. Um, Germany joined the League of Nations in 1926. Stressman received the Nobel Peace Prize. So this showed that Germany was starting to become accepted again by other international countries. So the key evidence for this and, and the key events to know about is that in 1925, in December 1925, Germany signed the Locarno Treaties with Britain, France, Belgium and Italy, where those countries promised not to invade each other. Now, this was important because this was an acceptance by Germany that they were now agreeing to the borders that were placed um, at the Treaty of Versailles. 
This led to um, an era which was sometimes known as the spirit of Locarno, where international relations between the different countries were really good. In 1928, um, in this spirit, Germany and 64 other countries signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact, um, saying that international disputes should be settled peacefully. As part of this um, improved cooperation with other countries, um, Germany was given loans from the United States of America to help them pay the reparations. Um, so that showed that Stressman's idea of fulfilment had worked and had been helpful. The Doors Plan of 1924 gave Germany longer to pay the reparations. The Young Plan of 1929 actually lowered the amount Germany had to pay uh, of the reparations from 6.6 6 billion to 2 billion. And Germany would, there was basically um, a program where they would have finished paying those reparations in 1988. However, many German people didn't like the plans. They didn't like the fact that Germany was accepting that they should pay the reparations. And there were huge protests against the Young Plan in particular from right wing politicians like Alfred Hugenberg, who was the leader of the German Nationalist Party, the DNVP. Now, all of this money rolling in from America led to an improved economy in Germany during this time. US loans led to investment in things like houses, hospitals, schools and roads. Loans were made to German firms. Exports increased. Um, Germany, um, by 1928, was the world's second strongest industrial power. Um, the problem with this, of course, was that the economy was too dependent on American loans. And therefore, if those loans were recalled, which, of course, they were in, uh, in 1929 and early 1930, that would be a huge problem. Farmers became poor due to um, low food prices and unemployment during this time remained high. So the idea is that some of the problems in Germany really only papered over during this time. So it seemed like Germany had recovered in the golden era, but many of um, the problems that the Weimar Republic had were, were not fully solved. Um, in terms of the key question about how stable was Germany politically, well, Germany was certainly more peaceful during this time. We, we've talked before about how there was a range of political assassinations between 1919 and 1922. Um, that doesn't continue during this time period. Um, between 1924 and 1928, there are no attempts to overthrow the Weimar Republic. Um, and remember, in the early years of Weimar, they had to contend with the Cat Putsch, the Spark is Rising, the Munich Putsch. Um, after the death of President Ebert, um, Hindenburg, who was an old war hero, was elected and he became a force for stability um, within um, the Weimar Republic. The Nazi threat had reduced and um, they only got 12 seats in the 1928 German election. Um, but there was still that political instability underneath. No single party could ever rule on its own. Uh, there were seven coalition governments between November 1923 and 1929. And this quote from Gustav Stressman is, is definitely worth remembering. The idea that Germany is dancing on a volcano. And he said, if the short term credits, the loans are called in by the USA, a large section of our economy would collapse. So one of the key things to think about during this time period in this era is that Germany's prosperity is kind of based on the American loans and they're sort of dependent on that. And if those loans are ever called back in, um, then, then Germany will not be prosperous. And of course, the, the Wall Street crash happens in October 1929, leading to a worldwide economic depression. Um, and remember that nice quote, if America sneezes, the world catches a cold. And obviously, this economic depression becomes pretty contagious and spreads to Germany um, in the early 1930s. Another feature of the golden age of um, Germany is about Weimar culture. Now, we know that the Weimar Republic was extremely democratic. There were new freedoms for people. And uh, this new freedoms led to a huge explosion in new cultural ideas in terms of literature, music, art, architecture, theatre and cinema. Um, in terms of literature, there were novels that focus on anti-war feelings, such as Eric Remarque's classic um, All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, in terms of architecture, uh, there's a new style of architecture, which was known as the Bauhaus style, which used modern materials to create new buildings. Um, again, there were some people in Germany, some more conservative forces that didn't like this ultra modern design, favoured a more sort of classical style in the buildings. And you can see the sort of a typical Bauhaus kind of um, architectural building there. The impact of the US loans obviously led to um, a booming kind of construction industry in Germany during this time, creating jobs. Um, also, Germany became famous for its music and cabaret during this time. Um, and some of the cabaret artists produced songs which criticised the government. Again, there's lots of freedom during this time. Berlin became famous for its nightclubs. But some Germans, um, particularly conservatives, people like Hitler, for example, found all of this um, quite shocking and uh, didn't particularly approve of this new Weimar culture. 
The cinema um, in um, the golden age, Germany became the center of the film industry. Berlin uh, was like the sort of Hollywood of the 1920s, if you like. Uh, there were German directors such as Fritz Lang, who made films such as Metropolis. Marlene Dietrich became a famous um, film star. She starred in one of the uh, films that was quite famous in the 1920s, was called The Blue Angel. But again, there were some conservative forces within Germany that found all of this quite immoral. Um, in terms of theater, uh, there were directors such as Bertolt Brecht, for example, produced plays about ordinary people um, rather than this sort of classic, um, you know, sort of theatre about heroes and things like that. Um, one of um, Brecht's musicals was called The Three Penny Opera. Um, some, some Germans thought um, that this was just a sign of the moral decline of, of Weimar. And then in terms of art, there was um, painters like Otto Dix, for example, who produced paintings which highlighted inequality between rich and poor. And again, some people disapproved of this art. Again, conservative forces, people like Hitler, for example, critical of this, preferred paintings which glorified Germany's history. So we've got really a cultural clash in Germany in the 1920s. We've got these new cultural ideas, uh, new modern ideas, um, freedoms, particularly amongst young people. But then we've got these old um, traditional conservative forces, forces that were probably loyal to the monarchy and the Kaiser and glorified Germany's military past that um, didn't like these new cultural ideas and, uh, and thought it was all immoral and a sign of the decline of uh, Germany during the 1920s. And, uh, you know, Hitler particularly focused on this in some of his campaigns in the early 1930s. And of course, all of this culture changed when the Nazis came to power in 1933. So there's just some key ideas there for you to think about. One of the key questions to look at on this part of the course is about how stable Germany was between 1924 and 1929. So just a few different ideas there to help you revise this topic. And you can pause that and have a look at some of those, those different ideas. So thanks for listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed that and, uh, and good luck. Thank you very much.